From NPR News, you're listening to the podcast edition of Weekends on All Things Considered, the best picks from our program on Saturday and Sunday. I'm Guy Raz. This episode, two cover stories. First, is Ohio one of the most politically diverse places in America? Oh, yes. And even if you go down the roads from one house to the next, President Obama, Mitt Romney, you'll, you'll see the signs alternating house to house. Why Ohio is the jewel in the electoral crown. Also, there's a new rush by universities to get on the online bandwagon, and it's already transforming higher education. The world around us is changing so quickly that one's education can't stop when you finish getting your degree. The digital transformation of higher ed learning and a conversation with the founder of Coursera, the company that's now offering 200 classes from the world's top schools. Also, why Catholics will likely vote for the winner, plus... Whatever happened to teen heartthrob Robbie Benson? I have had people come up to me and say, I haven't seen you for a while. I I thought you were dead. And later, new picks from 3-Minute Fiction and the return of Ben Folds 5. Read me off the list of the things I used to not like, but now I think are okay. That's all on this episode of Weekends and All Things Considered. Enjoy. Hello, Falcons! Those would be the Falcons of Bowling Green State University, where President Obama was visiting this week, campaigning in northwestern Ohio. Now, the very next day, 20 minutes away, Mitt Romney held a rally of his own. I know that they're out there chanting at his events, four more years, but let me ask you this. Do you want four more years with 23 million people struggling to find a job? And at both these rallies, Lots of people from Wood County, Ohio. The president was smack in the middle of Wood County, Mitt Romney just north of it. And why is this county, population 125,000, such an important place? Since 1960, it's uh, predicted every election except for one. Every presidential election except for 1976. That's Matt Rieger. He's the chair of the Wood County Republican Party. I think that it is a microcosm of Ohio, which in some parts is a microcosm of the United States. We have an even distribution of Democrats and Republicans who are registered, a little bit more on the Republican side. And then we have a large degree of independents. Almost 60,000 independents. That's more than the combined number of registered Democrats and Republicans in Wood County. That means, as Wood County goes, so goes Ohio. And no Republican has ever won the White House without it. Ohio, and why it matters quite possibly more than any other state this year, that's our cover story today. I went back to Ohio. Uh, let's begin our coverage with NPR's Ari Shapiro, our White House correspondent, who has been with both the Romney campaign and the Obama campaigns this past week. Ari, great to have you back. Thanks. Let's start with Romney's trip to Ohio. Um, what what was his reception like there? It was a big trip, and uh, they put a lot of resources into that trip. Big trip, big rallies, a bus tour after he left New York at the beginning of the week. He flew out there and joined his running mate, Paul Ryan. Whenever Ryan is with him, he has a little bit more energy, mm. and the audience is more enthusiastic than when he's on his own. Ohio is becoming the crucial state, as it has been in many elections before, that he's got to win. And frankly, for him, the numbers in the polls are going in the wrong direction right now. Do his, do, did you get a sense, being with the Romney team that, um, you know, they are concerned about the president pulling away from Romney in Ohio. They'd be foolish not to be concerned about that. As you say, the polls show the president with the lead of eight, nine, even 10 points in the New York Times poll this week. Uh, But when senior officials in the Romney campaign were asked this week, do you have a path to success without Ohio? And if so, what is it? They said, we're not going to count off any states. And clearly they are still campaigning really hard there. There are paths to victory Mm. without Ohio, but far fewer of them. And what about the Obama campaign? What was it like in Ohio with him this week? Well, you know, they said uh, they are not spiking the ball at the 30-yard line, as the Romney campaign accused them of doing, Mm -hmm. but they would rather be where they are, certainly, than where Romney is. Interestingly, Mitt Romney was out there saying why voters should vote for him. President Obama was saying, listen, early voting starts Tuesday, October 2nd. You can register to vote until October 9th. You need to go here, do this, say that. Every time the audience booed something Mitt Romney would say, President Obama would reply, don't boo, vote. Wow. So it was a very, very specific message so he about is tr- getting out and voting. He's trying to strike while the iron is hot. He's doing with the polls uh, are looking better for him in Ohio than they are for Romney. So he's saying early voting's opened up. Go do it. Yeah. It's a week of intense, intense mobilization for both campaigns between October 2nd, the day people can start voting in Ohio, and October 9th, the last day people can register to vote. Yeah. 
That's NPR's White House correspondent Ari Shapiro. So how will they vote? Well, as we heard from Wood County's Republican Chairman Matt Rieger, it's sometimes hard to predict. Wood County, remember, has only missed picking a president once since 1960. The county seat is Bowling Green. Which is the uh, quintessential college town right at the center of it. So you've got more Democrats in the center of the county. Surrounded by a lot of farms. And you've got more Republicans in the farmland. All right, we got one more puller on East Track. Or at least that's what we thought we'd find at this tractor pull in the town of Lucky, Ohio. Which presidential candidate do you think is going to win Ohio come November? I have a feeling it's going to be Mr. Obama. 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 Barack Obama. We sent producer Beanish Ahmed to two places in Wood County where we thought we'd hear a good balance of likely voters. The tractor pull, and then 20 minutes north to a farmer's market in historic Perrysburg where she met Dennis Dickey. And how long have you been in the salsa biz? Well, I've been making it for probably 35 or 40 years. A friend of mine from Mazatlan, Mexico, gave me the recipe. Now, if you had to guess which presidential candidate an artisanal salsa maker would be supporting, well, Obama's done nothing about anything. The economy still sucks. Unemployment's still bad. He shoved uh, health care down everybody's throat that didn't want it. And that's probably going to turn out to be really, really, really expensive. This is what makes Wood County so unpredictable. All kinds of political views in all kinds of places. Here's a bigger sampling from the tractor pull and the farmer's market. What candidate do you think best reflects sort of your interests? Um, at this point, I think probably Obama. I'm going to vote for Obama. Obama. Uh, he's got a better idea of where the common folk is. We pay more in health care than we do for our house payment. And do you think that has the Obama health care plan helped you at all? I guess it's given me a little sense of peace just because I know that my son can't be denied health care in the future because he had the liver transplant. And that was always a little bit nerve-wracking. You know, Ohio being an industrial state, the fact that he did help bail out the auto industry. He's not a hothead, especially with things that happen abroad. And uh, when I was laid off, he kept the unemployment coming so that I didn't lose everything. And Obama's a nice guy. He'd be a great neighbor. But he's not running the country. If you listen to Mitt Romney, he mentions God constantly and... I don't hear that out of the Democratic Party at all. Matter of fact, they want to take God and out of their uh, platform. Well, I support him because he don't let the illegals over here and put them in college free when my grandson can't hardly pay for his college. Yes, I did make my own business. And if he was talking about the roads, then it was my taxes that paid for those roads too. Likely voters in Wood County, Ohio, Lois St. Clair, Emily Keller, Chris Ducat, Roxanne Rideout, Sharon Williams, Jerry Robinson, Chuck Cassis, and Norris Edwards. Now, the president did seem to have a slight edge in our collection of Wood County residents. And why is that? Well, Alec McGillis, a senior editor with The New Republic, has been reporting extensively on Ohio over the past few months. And he says part of the Obama edge there might be explained by attack ads. A lot of these ads that ran in Ohio were not seen all that much elsewhere. They were very well targeted. The one that I think was most effective and got a huge viewing online as well, incredibly powerful one about a guy who just sits there and talks about the time that he and his colleagues at his uh, paper plant in Indiana were asked to build a stage one day. Not knowing what it was for, just days later, the folks come in from Bain, from Boston. A group of people walked out on that stage and told us that the plant is now closed and all of you are fired. And at the end of this ad, the guy says, Turns out that when we built that stage, it was like building my own coffin. It got two million YouTube views, this ad. One-sixth were in Ohio. Wow. which is vastly disproportionate, of course, to its share of the population. So you, we're often hearing this sort of conventional wisdom about the white working class voters, particularly men. And I wonder whether that's been um, overemphasized as a problem. Maybe is it possible that it really is not that big of a problem for Obama? It is possible. It's, it's really interesting. If you look at the numbers, Obama's so-called white working class problem 
is really a Southern problem. Mm-hmm. His standing with white working class, and white working class means white voters without college degrees. That's just the, the way it's defined. In the South, is just terrible. But in other parts of the country, Obama actually plays about even. With the white working class in the Midwest, Obama's actually head. So this mm-hmm. notion that he has this great white working class problem has always been somewhat overstated. That partly explains why he's in better shape in Ohio than we might have expected. So without Ohio, Romney would have to win Florida probably have to win Wisconsin, maybe Nevada, Colorado, Virginia. You have to come close to running the table in the rest of the battleground states. Right now, in virtually every battleground state, Romney is either far behind or behind but within the margin. So it's it's going to be an uphill battle for him. Oh, certainly. Um, one thing I think is that people are getting a bit wrong about his predicament is there's this notion that he should be doing better because the economy is so rough. Right. One reason that Obama is doing better than you might expect in Ohio is that unemployment in Ohio is down to 7% from well above 10%. The auto bailout, of course, played a huge part in this. There's also the whole shale gas boom in Ohio, which has is, which is really helped the state. The, the one other factor in Ohio that I think has been completely overlooked has been the advantage that the Democrats got there from the backlash against John Kasich's anti-union law. This really went under the radar nationally. This is an attempt to uh, to end collective bargaining. Exactly. He, it was very much voice. like very much like the law that Scott Walker passed in Wisconsin. And in Ohio, unlike in Wisconsin, the backlash won by a lot. In, the, in part because in, in in Ohio, it would have included cops and right. firefighters. Cops and firefighters were fire, yeah. exempted in Wisconsin, so it was made a huge difference to have everyone um, you know on the firing line in Ohio. And they trounced this law in the referendum, sixty-two to thirty-eight percent. That huge overturned turnout, this law. Overturned yeah. the law. Gave a huge morale boost. And just last week, the National Fraternal Order of Police announced that they would not be endorsing anybody this year. They've endorsed the Republican candidate for the last three elections, and they're setting this one out because they just couldn't bring themselves to endorse Mitt Romney. Alec McGillis, he's a senior editor with The New Republic. By the way, we asked Matt Rieger, chairman of the GOP in Wood County, what explains Mitt Romney's troubles in the state and the county? Well, part of it, he says, is the economy. It's doing pretty well in Wood County, and Matt Rieger attributes that to the policies put in place by local Republicans. The policies are the policies that Mitt Romney is advocating. And so on a national level, that's the kind of uh, policies that we want. And in Wood County, 13 of the 15 local elected officials are Republicans. I went back to Ohio, but my city was gone. Stay with us. A look at the Catholic vote. Does it even exist? Plus, later, Ben Folds 5 reunited. That's coming up on All Things Considered from NPR News. There's a popular class at Stanford University. It's called machine learning. And unbeknownst to Andrew Eng, the professor who teaches that class, it actually resolved a problem 7,000 miles away, a problem for a 22-year-old computer science student in Kazakhstan named Askat Muzrabayev. So the problem was that our university is relatively small. Uh, it has around 2,000 students. And... Uh, uh, we didn't have artificial intelligence classes in my syllabus. Ascot explains so, that at his school, uh, Suleiman Demerol University, there was no class like it on offer. So earlier this year, he went online to a site called Coursera, and he enrolled in Stanford's machine learning class, all for free. He watched the lectures, he did the quizzes, he joined online discussions with students from around the world who could talk about the problem sets. He took the final And he did great. He got 100 out of 100. And when it was over, Oscott received a certificate that said, you completed an online course at Stanford. They sent it uh, to my email address, and it was in PDF format. And he took that certificate around Almaty, the capital, to different companies. He also posted it to his LinkedIn profile. And not too long after, job offers started to pour in, including from Twitter in Almaty, where he now works. Oscott is now one of one and a half million students who've enrolled in one of the classes on offer from Coursera since it launched in January. Now, none of this is particularly new. Online education has been around since the 1990s. But what is new is the speed and scale. From NPR News, this is Weekends and All Things Considered. I'm Guy Raz. And our cover story today, the online future of higher education. In 
less than a year, many of the most prestigious research universities in the world have started to jump onto the online bandwagon. Later in the program, we'll speak with a co-founder of Coursera. It's a tech company that's partnered with more than 30 of the top universities in the world, including Stanford, Caltech, Michigan, and Princeton, to offer online classes from its course catalog all for free. We visited one of those partner schools, the University of Pennsylvania, to find out how all of these changes could potentially transform the way universities operate. I think everybody now realizes that technology is going to change universities. That's Ed Rock. He's a law professor who's also the coordinator of UPenn's online program that was launched earlier this year. The choice that faced Penn when we were approached by Coursera uh, was, do you want to be part of that conversation? Do you want to shape how technology is going to shape universities? Or do you want to just hide your head and pretend that's not going to happen? used to teaching 50 or 100 students at a time. The idea that you can teach 30,000 students at a time is an intoxicating possibility. If we had tried to do this 10 years ago, I think there would have been huge pushback. I think now everybody recognizes that the Internet changes everything, and the question is, how does it work for us? How does it fit with the Penn mission? There are now three major online consortiums that offer classes from some of the top universities in the world, places like Harvard and Berkeley and Oxford, Stanford, and, and many others. Coursera is the biggest, but Udacity and edX are also major players. Right now, each course costs the universities about $50,000 to mount. That includes a small stipend for the professor. But in the future, as we'll hear later in the program, nominal fees could make these offerings a lucrative possibility. What we're going to talk about today is a classic paper from the late 60s. It's 10.30 in the morning inside a lecture hall at UPenn's engineering school. About 100 or so students inside look like they've just rolled out of bed. They're here to take Michael Kern's popular course. It's called The Networked Life. And this morning, he's talking about a landmark paper that was written about four decades ago by Jeffrey Travers and Stanley Milgram. It's a paper that introduced the idea that we're all separated by six degrees. Kearns grabs a tennis ball to demonstrate how okay. it works. Um, so now I'm going to throw it back over here to Amanda. And everybody who knows Amanda, stand up. In just a few tosses of the tennis ball, Kearns okay. can show and how the students in that class are connected. Well. Now, thousands of miles away, in any direction, more than 40,000 students are also taking Michael Kearns' course. They're not watching this class simultaneously. They're actually watching a slightly different version of the class that Kearns filmed earlier. And they can take that class at any time of the day. They can log on and get close to the same experience online. And while it's not live, it's all there at the touch of a button. And this is what it sounds like. The roadmap for the rest of the lecture is that we're going to discuss the findings of two articles. Kearns designed the, the class to be taken over a period of 10 weeks. The actual lectures are just about 12 minutes long. There are also readings and quizzes and discussion boards. And once you've finished, you qualify for a certificate of completion, a certificate that is already worth full course credit at the University of Helsinki in Finland and could quite possibly come to be seen as a calling card to better jobs in countries around the world. But what does it all mean for the way universities will operate 10 or 20 years down the road? I put that question to Michael Kearns. If you ask me, you know, 10, 20 years from now, do I think that places like Stanford and Penn and MIT won't exist because of just massive online content and education? I don't think so. Do I think that the access to courses taught from those institutions will be widespread, pervasive, and accessible to, you know, a much, much larger audience? Yes. And do I think that those institutions will change the way they teach in the classroom because of the availability of content? I think yes. So I think these places will be around, but I think we'll be spending much less time, you know, droning on at students in a passive way because, you know, why wouldn't you just as easily watch the video? It's just a short stroll along UPenn's Locust Walk from the engineering buildings to the Kelly Writers House, where a class on modern poetry meets twice a week. For an everlasting roof, the gambrels of the sky. 
About 40 students sit inside the room. Al Philreese is the professor. And today, the lecture is on Laureen Niedeker's poem, Grandfather Advised Me. She was not a professional. She was informally educated, mostly self-educated. Now, most of the 200 classes available through Coursera are geared towards science and engineering students. But an increasing number of them are courses in the humanities, like Phil Reese's poetry class. And while a few dozen fee-paying UPenn students are sitting in this room, 32,000 others around the world are also studying Dickinson and Whitman and Niedeker and Langston Hughes, and it's Al, he's known as Al, that they see on the screen. The only difference is the name. Online, it's called Mod Po. There's an online bulletin board where those students can post questions. Al even hosts live web chats with his students. Here's Al in one of those web chats. You have four ways to participate in actually five. One way is just to listen. Now, the thing about uh, Al Phil Reese is that he's physical. He moves around. He channels the poetry. He calls on students way. without warning. Sometimes he throws high fives around. It was absolutely profound. Explain why. And this afternoon, when talking about Ishmael and Moby Dick, he grabs one student's shirt to make a point. I'm not sure I'd be able to grab the shirt of the 18-year-old in Indonesia who's taking Modpo, but I can do metaphorically grab his or her shirt. Uh, so there's some things. I can look into the faces of my students and realize immediately that they're not getting it. But I can also look into the metaphorical faces of the Modpo people when they're asking questions that are silly or they don't quite understand. I can go back in there and explain it. I can slow things down. I can reorient my questions. Just a different set of skills. And some of Al Phil Reese's students, students he will never meet, are actually quite well known, including Illinois Senator Dick Durbin, the majority whip who recently enrolled in that modern poetry class. You're like a rough-and-tumble guy up there in the Senate. You know, you gotta, you got to throw punches and take hits, and, and you're taking poetry. Why poetry? Well, the Bears games only last about three and a half hours each week, and I've got a lot of other time to fill. And seriously, I took a look at it and said, I never took a poetry course in college, and at this stage in my life, I should not be so ignorant when it comes to issues like Walt Whitman's poetry and Emily Dickinson and a lot of others. So I signed up for the Contemporary and Modern Poetry course. And uh, But you're a busy, busy man. I mean, you are the majority whip. There's lots of people to whip into shape. Uh, when do you find the time to do this? Well, the actual uh, class discussions that uh, I can tap into any time of the day count for about two hours a week, really. I mean, you spend a little extra time doing other things, but uh, it's not unreasonable. And when you think of all the miserable time you waste with reality TV and worthless uh, shows on 150 different channels, uh, you know, the way I see it, this is time better spent. How's the class going so far? Good. I really enjoy it. It's, uh, I haven't come to know my classmates uh, at this point. Mm, it's since, hard, I guess. Well, there are 30,000 in this yes. class. So. Yes. <laughs> but in the meantime, uh, I like the professor and the five or six students in his class are worth listening to. Uh, Al Phil Reese is his name. We spoke with him, and uh, he um, helped us out. We're going to give you a little quiz here. We went through the syllabus, uh, and uh, here's a poem uh, that you've studied, and we're going to ask you to identify it for us. So uh, let's listen to this one first. I dwell in possibility, a fairer house than prose, more numerous of windows, superior for doors, of chambers as the cedars, impregnable of eye, and for an everlasting roof, the gambrels of the sky. All right, Senator Durbin, who is the poet? Emily Dickinson. He got it. All right. It was one. one of our early ones, and I knew nothing about her, and I've really come to respect her. I mean, he's, he's given us a number of her uh, works. Here's the point. Uh, you know, I'm a member of the United States Senate, uh, and if I go to church, people say, well, good, he has a spiritual side. If I work out at the fitness center, they say, well, that's good, um, a sound mind and a sound body. I think poetry fits into the same mold. This idea of trying to rounding your life out a little bit, that you aren't totally consumed with just political argument. Have you taken a, a, a you know quill to parchment and written your own poetry? No, I've I've written quite a few speeches, but I've never really taken poetry very seriously. But I will tell you, in just a matter of two and a half weeks of dealing with this course, I read poetry differently. I used to go through the New Yorker, look for the cartoons in an interesting article. I stop and read the poetry now, and I think that might be a good thing. That's uh, Senator Dick Durbin, the Senate Majority Whip. And a Coursera student, he is taking modern poetry with Al Filreis at the University of Pennsylvania. Senator Durbin, thanks. Thanks a lot.
Now, there are still many kinks to be worked out, how to make sure no one's cheating for one thing, and how to evaluate essays. Right now, most of the testing is multiple choice. In a moment, we'll speak with the co-founder of Coursera. Stay with us. It's All Things Considered from NPR News. It's hard to believe that Coursera, the online education company we've been hearing about, was only launched this past January. Since then, 33 universities from around the world have signed up to be part of it. It was founded by two computer science professors at Stanford, Andrew Eng and Daphne Kohler. Coursera is a for-profit company. There are $16 million in venture capital behind it. So far, it's not making money, but its popularity has surged. In just nine months, one and a half million students from 196 countries have enrolled in its courses. Daphne Kohler believes that in five or ten years from now, people are going to look back and wonder why universities ever crammed 500 students into an auditorium to listen to a lecture for an hour and a half when they could just watch it online. But I think it's important to also remember that the role of physical institutions will still be important because there's still certain aspects of that experience that we can't currently replicate in online format. That serendipity, that miraculous uh, discovery that happens when people randomly get together and talk uh, creatively about new ideas. All right, let's talk about where Coursera is now. 33 universities are part of this consortium. And we're not talking about... And, you know, we're talking about the top universities in the world. 1.5 million students enrolled. We we, we just heard from one of those students who lives in Kazakhstan. Uh, We heard from another one who happens to be the Senate Majority Whip, uh, Dick Durbin. What do you imagine Coursera to be in the future? Is it going to be a place where anybody can get a degree from any of these schools? So our students are not getting degrees from our partner universities. They're getting education, which I think is a really important and valuable thing to get. And I think while degrees have a really important place in one's educational trajectory, we need to remember that one's progress towards a degree lasts maybe the first four or six years of your um, of your adult life. And then you go off into the world and uh, work on your job. And the world around us is changing so quickly that one's education can't stop when you finish getting your degree. But if it is going to be seen as an anachronism to shove 400 kids into a lecture hall, and why wouldn't Coursera be a place for people to earn a degree? So I think there's going to be perhaps more and more of the degree that is taken in an online format, but I think there's still a tremendous value to a university education. What do you mean by more and more of the degree? So one of the big motivations for the universities that are working with us in engaging with us is the fact that they want to open up more time in the curriculum for meaningful interaction between faculty and students and between students and their peers. And so if you can take the lecturing part and move it out of the classroom, all of a sudden you've opened up room for a much more interactive engagement that can happen in the classroom, what's come to be called the flipped classroom model. In other words, the students would watch the lectures online and then you would just go to class to interact with the professor and have a discussion. That's right. Uh, You could work together in small teams on active problem solving, and there's multiple educational studies that show that this is a much better learning experience than just sitting there passively listening to a lecture. Let's talk about money, because this is um, a business plan, essentially. You've got millions of dollars of venture capital behind Coursera, so presumably there are people who want to see a return on that investment. Um, How will you make money eventually? So one idea that we've explored is to charge for certification. You can charge a modest amount for, say, a certificate that then you can go and present to an employer or perhaps to an educational institution to get some kind of transfer credits. A second is by working with employers who are looking to close a skills gap, because even though there is rampant unemployment in many parts of the world, there are still large numbers of jobs that are going unfilled because employers are having a hard time identifying people with the right set of skills. And so by matchmaking between students who perform well in certain courses, with their consent only, of course, and uh, with employers looking to hire such people, you can potentially make a win-win situation for everyone, and then employers would basically help support this effort. So in a sense, you know, you might be able to give access to that data to 
corporations looking to find skilled workers, and they might be able to look through which students did very well in particular courses and how they contributed, and they could this could be like a, a recruiting tool. That's exactly right. We would only do this with student opt-in for privacy reasons, but um, this is definitely a win for students who are potentially looking for new career opportunities as well as for the employers. Uh, we just spoke to Askat, uh, a student in Kazakhstan. He's taken two classes at Stanford. By the way, he did take your class. So yep. I said it was pretty good. I actually liked it. Glad uh, to hear it. <laughs> he, he took his certificates of completion, and he showed them to potential employers in Almaty, in Kazakhstan, where he lives, and through that managed to get a job at Twitter. Is there a concern that could in some way diminish the brand of these universities, of the Stanfords and the UPens and the MITs? You know, people might look at these certificates of completion around the world and say, wow, you know, you, you went to uh, UPenn or Stanford. I think any reasonably savvy employer recognizes the difference between I took one or two online classes that were offered by a Stanford faculty member versus I attended Stanford or Princeton or Penn and I got a degree from one of those institutions. There is some resistance to this idea that um, this information will just be put online and... Um, could kind of create a two-tier kind of system. Have you encountered that? Two-tier systems have been around for a long time, and currently the second tier, if you will, are people who have no access to quality education whatsoever. But what we're trying to do, and I think are succeeding in doing, is improving the experience for all of the tiers. That is, for the students within the University of Pennsylvania, via this flipped classroom model, they're going to get a better experience by having more time to interact and engage with their professor. And for the students who never ever would have had access to this kind of quality education from a place like Penn or Princeton or Stanford, they now have access to something. And it's not mm. the same as the experience of the on-campus students, but it's a heck of a lot better than what they had before. That's Daphne Kohler. She's one of the founders of Coursera, which is an online education platform. She's also a professor in the Department of Computer Science at Stanford University. And Daphne Kohler, thank you so much. Thank you, Guy. <laughs> We just heard about the pivotal role Ohio will likely play in determining who will end up winning the White House. But both President Obama and Governor Mitt Romney would also do well winning another bellwether group, Catholics. Since 1972, every single presidential candidate who has won the popular vote has also won the Catholic vote. One in four voters are Catholics. Now, historically, they voted for Democrats. And the reason? Here's pollster Robert Jones with the Public Religion Institute. Part of it really is this alignment uh, between the labor union movement and Catholics who are really, up until the 70s, you know, still really concentrated in Catholic enclaves in bigger cities, still working class. The uh, Rust Belt and areas like right, that. That's right, Rust Belt. They were just beginning to be the Rust Belt uh, that, at that time. Uh, that's exactly right. And so I think it is this kind of interlocking between labor, the Democratic Party, and a Catholic base that we really see really intact all the way up through the late 1960s. So 1972 is the turning point. It's, right. it's Richard Nixon, of course, wins the popular vote, right. and more Catholics go with Richard Nixon rather than George McGovern. That's right. So what happens in 1972? What suggests the shift? Well, you know, I think it's a combination of things. What we really see is sort of a gradual movement. I mean, 1968, you know, it was 59 percent uh, voted for the Democratic uh, candidate in 1968 versus, you know, nearly 8 and 10 in Kennedy. So we had begun to see kind of a slide, but it's not really until 1972 that we really see this division with Catholics really going Republican or Democrat, depending on the election, uh, and looking really like the bellwether constituency that really goes with the general population. What's behind that, I think, really is 100 years of integration. So we have the biggest wave of Catholic immigration in the late 19th century. And then we have several generations. By the time we get to 1972, we have nearly a century of Catholic integration with Catholics uh, having upward mobility in terms of education, in terms of income, and I think, importantly, moving out of Catholic enclaves in larger cities like New York and Chicago. Let's talk about now. We still hear this notion of a Catholic right. voting block. Yeah. But there is no Catholic voting I think that's left. right. I mean, one thing to say is that this is a really large group of voters, and they make up a quarter of all American voters. But I, I would say there are at least two Catholic votes in the country, and they divide pretty cleanly by ethnicity. So white non-Hispanic Catholics, for example, in the last election supported John McCain over Barack Obama. However, if you look at the Latino Catholic vote, nearly three quarters of the Latino Catholic vote supported President Barack Obama. Which meant that Obama got more Catholic votes in total. 
That's right. But it was the Latino Catholic vote that, that put, put over. Obama over the top because the white Catholic vote actually went slightly for John McCain. So w- which reflects the, the white vote in general, which, which tends to favor the Republican over the Democrat. Exactly. How do campaigns appeal to Catholic voters? I mean, you've got, yeah. let's say, for example, you've got the Joe Biden Catholics, and then you have the yeah. Paul Ryan Catholics, right. two really distinctive wings of the faith. Well, I think one thing that's important is to understand that the official position of the Catholic Church is not necessarily the official position of Catholic voters. Yeah. Um, so just to give you a couple of examples, whereas the Catholic Church has a strong position against contraception, the overwhelming majority of, of Catholics say that they have no moral problems uh, with birth control or contraception. Catholics are basically divided on the issue of abortion overall, and a majority of Catholics actually support allowing gay and lesbian couples to marry, which is very different than, of course, the official Catholic Church position. So if you're you know, a Republican Party operative or a Democratic Party operative, it's a little bit complicated of how exactly to reach out to Catholic voters who have a very complex set of values that doesn't always line up with the official positions of the, of the Catholic Church. Robert Jones is with the Public Religion Institute. To get a better sense of those complex set of values he was talking about, we asked Catholic voters in two battleground states, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, what matters most to them this election. Everyone we asked at St. Francis Borgia Church in the town of Cedarburg, just outside Milwaukee, everyone we asked said they'll be backing Romney. Romney. Hands down. No question. I'll be voting for Mitt Romney. Because I appreciate a man running for office who can stand up and acclaim God. And he did it a number of times in his speech at the convention, and that's all important to us as Catholics. Certainly the Republican Party at present is standing up for those things that we believe in, which is no abortion, for one thing, flat out. Well, I think Catholicism, you know, you read the Bible, you go to church. I mean, certainly some of these issues are present in in a mass, and um, typically Catholic people are a little bit more conservative. That was Tom Conlin, Gary Peterson, and Michelle Fitzpatrick, all worshipers at St. Francis Borgia Church in Cedarburg, Wisconsin. Now, we found a very different set of Catholic voters a thousand miles away at visitation of the Blessed Virgin Mary Parish in Philadelphia. So far, I'm going for and I'm thinking of Obama. 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 Well, there's a couple of goals that he sets. You know, for us Hispanic, as in making better education and the economy to make more jobs. I believe in no abortions. I believe in that. There's different situations while people do what they do. So, you know, who am I to judge? I just think Obama cares more for, like, people who don't have means. The voices of Leslie Rodriguez, Maribel Romero, and Desiree Santano, who we spoke to outside visitation of the Blessed Virgin Mary Parish in Philadelphia. The latest Pew poll, by the way, has President Obama up 15 points over Mitt Romney with all Catholic voters. That's up from a two-point lead he had in June. And while the two candidates are tied among white Catholics, President Obama gets a big boost from Latino Catholics. If you opened up a teen magazine, say, any time between 1975 and 1982, there's a pretty good chance you'd find a large photograph of Robbie Benson. You name it, he was in it. Ice Castle, The Chosen, One-on-One. And then, in 1991, he was the voice behind the Beast in the Disney film Beauty and the Beast. Do you remember the words, by the way, to The the Beast? No, I don't. I could do your Um, part for you. you, If you start it, I'll bet I could... Okay. She glanced this way. All right. She glanced this way. I thought I saw. And when we touched, she didn't shudder at my paw. No, we can't be. Da da dee dee. Ah da dee. Ba da 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 dee da. There you go. Robbie Benson still has it. I spoke to him this week about his new memoir. It's called "I'm Not Dead Yet." And why did he pick that title? I have had people come up to me and say, "I haven't seen you for a while." I I thought you were dead. So, <laughs> it's, a, so it's a very nice, so me, nice way to introduce oneself. Well, yeah, actually, that's one of the nicer ways. Um, <laughs> but I just find that to be a funny title. Yeah, because people haven't seen you in film. I mean, you were, at a, at a certain point, easily one of the biggest stars on screen. I mean, you were in everything. And yeah. you started out as a child actor. Why right. do you think you were able... To, to kind of reinvent yourself as a, as a writer and a director and, and, and a musician. Right. I was one of the fortunate ones because I grew up 
in the theater. So there's a huge difference between growing up in the theater or, let's say, growing up on TV where you're supposed to look cute, memorize some lines, hit a mark, and then you get paid thousands and thousands of dollars. And you lose perspective. Robbie, I want to talk about the second meaning of this title to your book, I'm Not Dead Yet, because it's actually about something quite serious, um, which is your heart condition. You were you were born with a heart murmur, right. um, but it really wasn't, it wasn't until your late 20s that you sort of realized something was wrong. What happened? Little by little, I would be working and I would become symptomatic. And those symptoms for me were shortness of breath, dizziness, some of the same symptoms that you'll always hear when it comes to any problems with your heart. And at the same time, I'd be working with phenomenal actors, John Marley, Rod Steiger. Both of these men would take me aside, and we'd have long conversations about this, about that, and it would eventually get very personal, and they would tell me that they had heart problems. But they could never say a word about it, and it's a secret. And they said, you know, Robbie, if by any chance you ever run into this, um, make sure you never tell anyone. You must keep it a secret because it's career suicide in Hollywood. But why would it be a problem? It's a problem because of insurance. When you're an actor, you have to go through the insurance process in order to be insured for a film, especially if you're starring in the film, but, but all parts that last more than one day. And the reason is because it's very, very expensive, and this sounds absolutely so cold, but if you're halfway through the movie and something happens to an actor that is predetermined, the insurance company could have known about it and not given you insurance, but you're on screen and they've already shot half the movie and now you cannot continue. That is remarkably expensive for the studio. And so m my best acting was always in the doctor's office when I would get an insurance checkup. When I was in the room and I was in the room alone putting on, let's say, a gown, I would be doing push-ups and sit-ups. So when they came in, it was like, whoa, wow. they hardly even listen to my heart. So you managed to so, get away with it each time. I, I would, and it literally was some of the best acting I've ever done. <laughs> um, you were um, 28 uh, when you had your first open heart surgery. Right. That was the first of four open the heart surgeries. The first of four. What about your heart? I mean, do you have to constantly monitor it? I mean, is there... I, I, I hate to even ask this question, but is there a risk that you could you know, have a, a massive heart attack. Well, there's there's always a risk, and I, I think that um, I'm so lucky because they've educated me so well. I do, because of this last surgery, have a mechanical valve, which means that I'm on Coumadin, which is warfarin, which is a, a blood thinner. So every week I have to have my INR checked to make sure that my blood levels are in the right place so I don't throw a clot. Um, but that's absolutely nothing. They've, they've given me life. That's Robbie Benson, the actor, writer, and director. His new memoir is called I'm Not Dead Yet. Robbie Benson, thank you so much. Oh, man, thank you. It's an honor to be on this show. Thank you. <laughs> Close to 4,000 stories. That's how many pieces of original fiction you submitted to us for this latest round of our three-minute fiction contest. Now, if you missed the deadline this time, don't worry. We're going to launch a new round right after this one. But in the meantime, we're going to start pouring through those stories that did come in with help from graduate students at more than a dozen schools, including NYU, the University of Alabama, and Wash U in St. Louis. Every story will be read. The best ones will be passed on to our judge this round, the novelist Brad Meltzer. Now, the challenge was to write a story under 600 words, as always. But this time, it had to revolve around a U.S. president, fictional or real. And over the next few weeks, we're going to read excerpts from some of the standouts, including this one. It's called Butterflies. He finishes knotting his American-flagged tie and steps back, assessing. The office has taken its toll. He looks older, more jowly, slackened. 
His hair is grayer than it was four years, seven years ago. Some days he thinks it's his father looking back at him, and he waves, two-fingered. His wife is in the kitchen, sipping a cup of coffee, the rest of the pot keeping warm. He crosses the room to pour himself a cup, but stops midway, thinking of something else. Is today my speech? Avis smiles. It could be. He takes a piece of bread from the bag and plate from the cabinet, and then he stands, the bread limp and pliable in his hand, wondering what he meant to do with it. These days, thoughts slip in and out like butterflies. If he tries too hard to capture one, it flaps against his skull, escapes beneath his eyelids. It's the speech on the deficit, isn't it? Maybe. There's a wrongness to the kitchen, the way the light folds, unfamiliar, overly white. Avis is still wearing her blue daisied house dress. There should be a cluster of people. He shouldn't be the only one dressed. He pauses, listening for the expedient footsteps of his chief of staff, and then a fluttering in his throat, nerves like he used to get before big crowds. We're still in Washington, aren't we? Once president, always president, right? Not strictly speaking, no. Avis pours him a cup of coffee, sugar, and cream. At least he still remembers what he likes. And there, the butterfly alights, its wings still, and Alan Prestwick knows they are not in the White House any longer. That was NPR's Susan Stamberg reading an excerpt from the story Butterflies, written by Jennifer Dupree of Harrison, Maine. You can read the entire story and others. We'll be posting at our website, npr.org slash three-minute fiction. Three-minute fiction is all spelled out with no spaces. And be sure to tune in tomorrow to hear another excerpt from another story. And in the coming weeks, we're going to pick the winner, and that story will be published in the Paris Review. And it's time now for music. in the late 1990s, the band Ben Folds 5 started getting a lot of national attention for their quirky lyrics and piano-driven power pop. Until that point, they'd been a local favorite in their hometown of Chapel Hill, North Carolina, but their 1997 record, Whatever and Ever Amen, made them and frontman Ben Folds stars. the success of that album, their follow-up called The Unauthorized Biography of Reinhold Messner fell flat. Critics loved it, but the fans, well, they wanted more of the same, and the new album was somewhat complicated. The people who came for the hit go away on your next record. That's frontman Ben Folds. The band went on tour for a year to promote that record, and when it was all done, the members of Ben Folds 5 were done as well. Exhausted. If we weren't enjoying it, I don't really know how... We expected to make great music, and if it doesn't seem inspired for any reason, it's it's time to move on. There was no real discussion. And so in 2000, Ben Folds 5 split up. Now, Ben Folds 5 is actually not five, but three. There's singer Ben Folds, drummer Darren Jesse, and bassist Robert Sledge. They spent most of the past dozen years doing their own things. But now they've reunited with a new record called The Sound of the Life of the Mind. And bassist Robert Sledge says that process began back in 2008, when for just one night in Chapel Hill, they got back together again on stage. Within 30 minutes of rehearsing, I personally felt like we had never broken up. The band played so well together, and I thought it was going to be much harder. I thought it was going to be maybe a little bit more uncomfortable between the members. I thought it would be a little bit more of a struggle musically. And it was just super easy. And so it really formed in my mind, like, oh, we could probably do a, another record. We could probably go out and tour. We could probably do a lot of things because musically we're in the right headspace. You guys um, have this style on your records um, and Ben on your solo records where you you tell these stories, these kind of narratives, and they seem to refer to true things. You had a, a song on one of your records called Stephen's Last Night in Town. It was very sort of visual. You were thinking about this party, and there was this sort of irritating guy at the party singing about, you know, telling Linda McCartney stories, just weird stories. And there's a song on this record about somebody named Michael Prater 
five years later. Yeah. Who is Michael Prater? Well, literally, Michael Prater is our monitor man. He, um, he runs the monitor for shows? Yeah, and um, I make up a song on stage nearly every night. I've seen you in concert, by the way, uh, mm. and, and you do this. You just It's like improv, like yeah, improv yeah. comedy. Someone throws something out, and you'll write a song. I'm a really slow and fearful writer. Like, I really have a hard time finishing songs. But what I do love is that the other side of my brain can complete a song, three-minute song with... Uh, chorus and verses and everything you know they're not classics but a lot of times they're very classic melodies or very classic ideas uh what the song ended up being about rather than my monitor man who just ends up being his his uh, name in it is just about the kind of person that you run into over and over again in your life and you just don't know why and at some point in your life i think you start to realize that you walk life's path with random people and you have to sort of embrace that to some extent i know Speaking with Ben Folds and Robert Sledge, two members of the trio better known as Ben Folds Five. Their new record is called The Sound of the Life of the Mind. Um, how would you sort of describe what this record's about? Well, at some point I thought this record was about um, the losing of the ego. That was the most obvious thing to me, and I guess it was something that I had been thinking about. So a lot of the characters and moments all lead to that. On being frank is one example. There's a tour manager who's been working for Frank Sinatra for 30 years, and Frank Sinatra died. Then suddenly his life has been, I am Frank Sinatra's tour manager. His identity is completely tied up with Sinatra, so the song is about being lost in that kind of way. And that, there's a lot of that in the album. I My tour manager said a lot of these things, and I thought about it, and um, I kind of liked uh, using Sinatra instead. Oh, he was saying that his whole life was sort of tied up, his identity was tied up with you, with being... Not really me so much as, because he hadn't worked for, he's worked in, in the business a long time, and, and not for me for as long, but his point was, you know, at my age, and he's 60-something, and he's like, at my age, I, I don't even know where to set the thermostat. I always do these things for other people. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. I thought it was compelling for a song. I don't know if Frank Sinatra had a tour manager for 30 years straight. I think he probably did. Um, the title of this record, The Sound of the Life of the Mind, is inspired, I believe, by a collaboration, Ben, that you did a few years ago with the writer Nick Hornby. Yes. And you have a song on, on the record with that title. Yep. And uh, I really w wanted to ask you about this song because it is full of all kinds of references to Copernicus, to Fortune's Wheel to Plato, the New Deal. What, what's this about? Yeah, those are Nick's lyrics. It's about a friend of his, uh, Sarah Vowell, and just about growing up, you know, inside books, inside history and literature, and that's how she survived and triumphed. Sarah Vowell, she just can't bear. How are you guys going to um, figure out what's next for Ben Folds 5? Are you not even thinking about that? You're just going to focus on this record and this tour, and maybe you'll do something else, maybe you won't? Yeah, that's right. We're going to get through the year and a half of touring that we've got going on and um, see what happens next. 
there's so many ideas and so many other things that people and relationships that people in this band have going on outside of the band that um you know it'd be a shame to sort of limit that so i think ben's going to do some more symphony work in in uh, 14 and i'm going to watch my son go from eight to nine years old probably that sounds like a pretty good plan uh, that's robert sledge and ben folds of ben folds five the band's new record is called the sound of the life of the mind uh, ben folds robert sledge thank you so much for being with us Thanks for having me. Thank you. Tell me what I said I'd never do. Tell me what I said I'd never say. Read me off a list of the things I used to not like, but now I think are okay. For the week ending September 30th, 2012, that's the podcast edition of Weekends and All Things Considered, the best of our programs from Saturday and Sunday. This week, the show was directed by Phil Harrell. Our production staff includes Kenya Young, Lauren Silverman, Brent Bachman, Lily Percy, Brenda Salinas, and Amy Held, with help from Sarah Ventry. Our interns are Brenda Sprunt and Acacia Squires. Tony Maturi is our senior editor, and Steve Lichtai is our senior producer. I'm Guy Raz. We're back next week with more of the best stories and features from all things considered on the weekend. Thanks for tuning in. Trust and joy I'll drain from her innocent face But you must do it anyway It sucks, but do it anyway Call it surrender, but you know that's a joke And the punchline is you were actually never in control But still, surrender anyway Tell me what you said you'd never do Tell me what you said I think you're okay.